processes such as cell signalling, cell movement, cell division or cell identity. Ultimately, we hope to identify and understand the causes of CHD, so new therapies and improved surgical interventions can be offered to patients to improve their quality of life and prognosis. My name is Dr Donna Page and I research congenital heart disease at the University of Manchester. Cancer happens when cells mutate and start to grow uncontrollably. It's not long before the cancer cells outcompete the healthy cells and a tumour forms. Imagine the cancer is an oak forest. A forest grows in a localised place, gradually increasing in size. As it does this, it starts to run out of the nutrients it needs and growth starts to slow down. Indeed, as the tumour mass expands, it often gets further away from the bloodstream 
can also start to lose access to crucial molecules it needs for growth, most notably oxygen. Obviously, the oak trees cannot move, and so to continue future growth, they produce acorns. These acorns can fall into streams and be transported to other places. If the acorn ends up in a hospitable environment for growth, it can grow into a tree and start a new forest. In much the same way as the oak trees, growing tumours are usually derived from epithelial cells that do not have the capability to move. In order for this to happen, the cells must undergo a dramatic change in shape to transform themselves into a motile cell. This process is known as the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, or EMT, and once it has occurred, the now motile cell can migrate through the normal tissues and into the bloodstream, transporting it around the body to sites where it can revert back to a stationary cell and initiate a secondary tumour, or metastases. Look at it this way. Different types of seeds have different optimal growing conditions, and so they will each grow best in different soil types. The same goes for different types of cancers, which favour certain secondary sites in the body. In over 60% of metastatic breast cancers, migrating tumour cells initiate secondary tumours in the lungs, liver or bone. At this point, the cancer is incurable and the treatment options are much more limited as surgery is no longer possible. With this in mind, my research revolves around finding a way to stop metastasis. By halting the seed from leaving or poisoning the soil, it could be possible to prevent this cell migration. My name is Henry Pegg and I'm a PhD student in the Paul Shaw Lab at the University of Manchester. Antibiotics or antibacterial compounds kill or halt the growth of certain bacteria and can be used to treat infection. Antibacterial substances naturally occur in mould or fungi and have been used since ancient times for healing. Sir Alexander Fleming identified an important antibacterial compound named penicillin and influenced the dawn of the antibiotic era. Since then, antibiotics are one of the most common drugs used by humans and in agriculture. Without doubt, they continue to save millions of lives around the world. But there is a crushing downside called antibiotic resistance. This is an evolutionary process whereby the chemical structures of bacteria adapt and defend against contact with antibiotics. This natural process cannot be stopped, but human intervention has massively speeded it up and more and more people are getting ill for longer and even dying because their bacterial infection is resistant to existing antibiotics. It is estimated that at least 25,000 people a year are dying in Europe because of antibiotic resistant infections. 10 million deaths a year are predicted by 2050. Several human interventions have increased the speed that bacteria have become resistant to available antibiotics. Firstly, an alarming number of people have been given antibiotics by their doctor, or in some countries they can be bought from a local shop even though they didn't have a bacterial infection. One of the most common reasons people are prescribed and take antibiotics is to treat the common cold. Colds are viral and not bacterial illnesses and antibiotics will not have any effect. Secondly, in hospitals, poor hygiene has encouraged the spread of resistant bacteria. And thirdly, the use of antibiotics as growth promoters in agriculture have reduced the lifespan of existing antibiotics. Alongside all this, the pharmaceutical industry has not produced new antibiotic drugs for several decades. Consequently, doctors are left trying to treat more patients with infections resistant to available treatment. How can this be reduced? Global use of existing antibiotics has to be drastically reduced. Scientists and students at the University of Manchester are here to help. We run campaigns to educate people about antibiotic resistance. First, you can learn about basic hand hygiene to stop harmful bacteria spreading. Second, remember antibiotics cannot stop a cough or cold. And third, realise that antibiotic resistance is something each and every one of us can do something about. My name is Angela Spencer and I'm a lecturer on the Masters in Public Health at the University of Manchester. Molecular pathology is the study of molecules in disease. Molecules might be things like DNA and proteins. 
At the Manchester Molecular Pathology Innovation Centre, we are working to discover new biomarkers and turn these into clinically usable tests that will improve and speed up the process of diagnosing, predicting and identifying the best treatment for diseases in question. A biomarker is a biological molecule found in blood, other bodily fluids or tissues that is a sign of a normal or abnormal process or of a condition or disease. A biomarker can be used to see how well the body responds to a treatment for a disease or condition. In this way, a biomarker acts like a highlighter. You have probably given a biological sample for testing when visiting the doctor at some point in your life. For example, you may have provided a urine sample for testing glucose levels, so your doctor or nurse can tell you might be suffering from diabetes. Glucose is a very common biomarker for diabetes. Through measuring this biomarker, doctors can put patients into groups who might have diabetes and those who do not have diabetes, those who have more highlights versus those who have less. Just as one size of clothing doesn't fit every person, not all treatments are beneficial to every patient. Precision medicine is an approach to treating patients through categorising them into groups based on their risks of having a particular disease or how likely they are to respond to a particular drug or therapy. By looking at what highlights are present, doctors are able to better determine which treatment is needed. It is important that the correct tests are available that can identify which individuals fit into which groups, depending on their exact disease type and likely response to particular treatments. It's like developing a new ultra-specific highlighter which can be used to highlight a specific disease marker. At the Manchester Molecular Pathology Innovation Centre, we are looking to discover new biomarkers so that we can create new clinical tests. We hope that we can find simple and effective tests for diseases which will give doctors powerful new tools for better diagnosing patients. We are the Manchester Molecular Pathology Innovation Centre at the University of Manchester. That was seamless, wasn't it? I'm quite pleased about that, actually. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Welcome to uh, Manchester University on this lovely autumnal day. It's a really nice day to look around the campus and see it in all its uh, finery. Welcome to people who are here in the lecture theatre and to those who are in the overspill lecture theatre as well. I hope you can hear me fine. We're actually going to... I'm going to be talking uh, on my own today. Normally, I've got... There are two academic admissions officers. Um, I'm, I'm one of them. I'm Dr Ruth Grady. Uh, and I'm a, a microbiologist. I'm getting ahead of myself. I've got to do the fire check. Of course, there's no alarm um, going to happen today, but if there is one, we will have to evacuate. You can actually leave the uh, lecture theatre on both sides. So even though you all came in one side, you can leave on both sides and at the top at the back as well. Uh, there you go. Right. So, oh yeah, so I'm a senior lecturer in microbiology, and I'm here to talk to you about the biosciences all of our programmes that we do in biosciences. So if you're here for the wrong talk, feel free to leave now. Uh, we, we won't look at you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what are the biological sciences, um, you know, why would you want to study them in the first place, what to look for in a course, um, and about the flexibility of our courses here and how it might differ for other universities, because that's a very good comparison uh, for you. Uh, and then I'm going to talk to you about what you could do with a degree in biological sciences. Okay, so here, here is our definition. It, it's quite daunting when you're looking at universities because, of course, different places call it different things. We, we call it biological sciences here. Sometimes we use the word biosciences. We include any study that contributes to the understanding of life processes. Other places may call it biomolecular or may call it life sciences or just plain biology. But they're, they're all covering pretty much the same kind of topics. We have 15 different flavours here uh, in Manchester. Um, biochemistry, biology, biology with science and society, all these different ones. And these will all count as just one of your UCAS um, options. There's, if you're interested possibly in medical physiology or pharmacology, you know, you just have to put us down once. And I'll tell you about the um, process for applying here later. Now, the actual nuanced differences between the degree programmes, I'm not going to go through those here. I'll go through some um, major ones. But you, what you really need to look at is our website, our admissions website. And this will give you a drop-down menu of options in your first year, you know, mo modules that you have to do, 
actually we don't call them modules, units that you do in year one, which ones are compulsory, which ones are optional, which ones in year two. And we really, really recommend to go over to the Michael Smith building after this talk. Some of you would have been there already. We have stands for all the degree programmes. Uh, there are ambassadors, student ambassadors who are doing the degrees now and some of the degree uh, programme directors as well. Okay, so you, you can ask questions about the specifics between the degree programmes uh, from the students and the programme directors. So why, why would you want to study biosciences? What has brought you into the field of biosciences? Well, of course, it's a really interesting subject in its own right. Uh, you know, everybody loves David Attenborough, don't they? I mean, we've all loved nature programmes. These are great. That, that might be the reason why you've come into biosciences. But we're very interested in thinking about big questions and <coughs> challenges, unanswered questions, and where we can play a role in that in the future. So it may be that you're very interested in um, understanding the world as it is, so exploring um, the planets and thinking about you know, what's on the bottom of the ocean. You know, we don't really know. So there's loads of research to be done there. We want to secure our future on the planet as well. So we need to think about food security. Can we feed the population as it grows? And what about global climate change? What effect is that going to have for future generations? That may be your driver for doing bioscience. You may, of course, be interested not just in, in life in general, but in human life and development. You know, how, how do we develop how we do? You have an egg, you have a sperm, come together, you know, we have lots of cell division, and at some point we get this baby that has, usually has two arms and two legs, but not always. You know, sometimes it goes wrong in development. And other animals, can we learn from them about human development? If you take a salamander and you, you, know, you um, remove a leg, remove a limb, within a month, that limb will have grown back. The salamander can redirect the stem cells from the bone marrow to that point, and the stem cells will differentiate to make a limb that works within a month. Now, we can't do that as humans, and we want to understand why not. So we have researchers looking at, can we grow new body parts? You know, can we do it in the lab and can we take it into human life and make people's lives a little bit easier? We have people looking at neurodegenerative diseases as well, so thinking about the brain. Of course, lots of people are very interested in disease, whether it's infectious disease from microorganisms or whether other diseases of the body, uh, cancer, when cell growth goes um, wrong, etc. And we're very interested in new treatments and diagnostics so we can help our lot in life. But of course, what we want to help our graduates do is to help answer all those unknown problems that we don't know are there um, and we, haven't, we can't solve them at the moment. And we know that solving these big problems in the future will take a multidisciplinary approach because it will need the bioscientists. It will need other scientists as well. It will need engineers. It will need uh, maybe an economic solution or a political solution. So we need to be able to work in teams with other people, not just thinking we are a bioscientist doing our little bioscientist bits. We need to be able to interact with other people as well. And of course, lots of these questions are being addressed here in Manchester. We are a very big research-intensive university. And we have done very well in our um, research performance, which was reviewed um, earlier, earlier this year. So if you look at our research pages, they are really worth a browse. Now, you may find yourself going down rabbit holes because there's more and more things to look at that we do. So th these are just some of the, the highlights. You know, our university has made biotechnology one of its beacon projects. You know, we are th at the forefront of an industrial revolution, again, in biotechnology. You know, so we need to think, uh, you know, about what we can do about fossil fuels. Uh, you know, we can't use them in the future. Are there alternatives, are there biological alternatives like using algae or manipulating algae to produce lipids that maybe we could use? We need to think about, um, you know, cancer. Our cancer research centre here in Manchester is uh, a partnership between our faculty and our school, 
uh, between the Cancer Research um, Campaign, Cancer, Cancer Research UK, which is one of the largest cancer charities, and then the Christie's Hospital, which is an NHS Foundation Trust Hospital in South Manchester. So we have the expertise here. We have the scientists, we have, we have some money coming in, and we have the, the hospitals and the doctors who are interested in thinking about things like the cell cycle. We know that cancer is uncontrolled cell growth. So what happens when it goes wrong, when all those checkpoints go wrong and we get tumour uh, growth? So we need to understand things like how the cells are signalling to each other. You will learn that on courses here about cell signalling. Some uh, researchers are looking at modelling cell migration, whether that's through imaging technology or it's through uh, biomodelling and computer computerisation. So these are all things that research that's being done here, so we have the expertise to bring that into our undergraduate curriculum. We also have um, our Manchester Environmental Research Institute. Again, this is an amalgamation of our faculty and the Environmental Sciences uh, School as well. So we're looking at addressing environmental challenges on the planet. We have a research group here in our school that's very interested in fish. Now, we're not a big marine biology university, but this research group is very interested in what migratory fish do. Uh, and in particular about where they spawn and their reproductive success. Because as ocean temperatures rise, what is going to happen to these fish? And these are ones at the bottom of the food chain. Uh, so we have people looking at that here. That may be something that you're interested in. We have all of these research um, groupings, if you like. In fact, we have the largest biological timing research community in Europe here at the University of Manchester. Now, body clocks might not mean anything to you, other than that you don't really like getting up in the morning and you like partying late at night. That's not me, can I just say. Um, I'm totally uh, I lost, lost that part of my life now. But body clocks, you may know as circadian rhythms, or this idea that organisms, all organisms, can track the passage of time uh, using um, you know, uh, genetic clocks inside every cell of their body, and um, this is controlled by the brain. And we know that this then controls how the organisms function. It's when hormones are released, when we're best at digesting our food, when we get our growth hormones released. Because, and we know that when these body clocks go wrong, that's when we get disease. And we get systemic disease, so things like diabetes or cancer, asthma, cardiovascular diseases. So we have a lot of people here who are looking at the genetics of body clocks. You know, what are the genes? How are they passed on? How do they get damaged? What do they do? And, and what's the outcome of them? So the, the Body Clock Centre, very, very important part of research here. We have the Stem Cell Centre as well, and our regenerative network, uh, medicine network here. So again, about trying to regenerate new tissues. And if you think about any organ in the body, there will be somebody studying it here, whether it's the liver, the pancreas, the lungs, the heart. There will be somebody here who's got money in and is researching it, which adds to a huge richness of, of what we do. People always ask us, what would you say your research speciality is here in Manchester? And I would say in the biosciences, we have lots of areas of specialism. Now, if you want something a little bit different, our Centre for Historical Study is very interested in looking at the context of biology. Uh, so it's, uh, mixed, it's integrated with medical humanities and science communication um, staff as well, and the academic discipline of science communication. And we want to think about science. Why do we practice science the way we do? Where does our scientific method come from? And just because you know, it's been done like that in the past, how are we going to do it in the future? And just because we can do some things, should we be doing them? What are the ethics of some of the science breakthroughs that are coming through? Who is going to determine science policy? Who has that kind of scientific literacy where they understand the bioscience, but they can put that forward in law and legalities as well? So we have a whole centre uh, that offer units to our undergraduate students that are thinking about this overall context of science, and not just in, in society, but also in film and in media and how we perceive science to people who maybe aren't actually studying science. So it's a re really interesting unit that people have a chance to do from our centre, uh, 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 Chisholm Centre. And of course, uh, we're very interested in the brain, Alzheimer's and dementia. So whether this is looking at the molecular side of what's going on in Alzheimer's, the proteins that aren't folding properly, 
or whether it's about um, living with dementia and looking at the patient side of it, all of this kind of research goes on here in Manchester. And I've alluded to this before, our infection and inflammation studies. Uh, we have uh, the new Lydia Beckett Institute here of Immunology and Inflammation. And this houses a lot of our researchers who are interested in studying disease. And they really came to the fore during the COVID crisis, which of course is still ongoing, and thinking about you know, COVID uh, and future outbreaks, um, maybe of different diseases. We have lots of people here looking at fungi. Fungi tend to get overlooked. But we know in hospitals, especially if you're um, you know, immobilised in hospital, invasive fungi can be a real big problem. We have drugs for them, but a lot of these drugs are very old-fashioned. They have lots of side effects, and the fungi is starting to get um, resistant to them. So that, that idea of invasive fungi being a, a problem is, is something that we're very aware of here in Manchester. So I banged on long enough about the subjects. There are loads of different parts of biology, and you get to sample all different parts of it here whilst you're studying. So I'll talk about sort of some practicalities, uh, if you like. So I said we had 15 degree uh, courses. They are all um, offered to whatever bioscience degree programme you come in on. And because we're such a research-intensive university, we have people who can cover all of these uh, different topics. We've got over 300 academic staff available uh, to teach. We have people who are research-intensive, world-leading research, and we also have people who are um, specialised teaching staff as well, who are very uh, attuned to teaching and thinking of best practice for taking teaching uh, forward. And so that's good, because it means that we can teach about things that we're really interested in. So I do the microbiology bits, along with a team of other people who are doing research in microbiology, where somebody else can talk about cell membranes or bits of the brain about which I know nothing about. And of our 15 uh, degree courses, as I say, we have quite a common first year. So there are some units that everybody does, and some degree programmes will have um, some options that you can go for. Some, if you're doing some of our other degrees, which I'll, I'll come on to in a moment, uh, you may have the options taken up for you uh, when we tell you which, which those options should be. But that's the reason why you should look at our drop-down menus on our admissions page, and you can see how much free choice you actually have in the different degree programmes. And it, it's important that we have that common first year, because some people will be coming in with no biology, some people will be coming in with no chemistry. Some people will be coming in with biology, chemistry, and maths. Uh, and, you know, know, maybe know what bit of biology you're interested in. But we know that if you want to go into medical research, you know, biological science research, and you're a neuroscientist, say, you also need to know some molecular biology. You also need to know something about pharmacology. And if you look at researchers in a laboratory, and you ask them, oh, how, how did you end up working in, in Alzheimer's research? You'll find that some of them came in as chemists because they're interested in protein folding. You'll find some of them came in as computer, they did computer science because they're interested in modeling. Some of them came in with a psychology degree because they're interested in how we live with these brain conditions. You know, so there is no one pathway you have to take or follow to get a particular position. So we want people to communicate with each other and have this cross-discipline in biosciences and then be able to cross with other disciplines as well. So we want to have that, to use common parlance, a growth mindset. Tick the box, got it in there. So a nice growth, so we don't want people to be too fixed about what they want to do because the subject is growing and changing all the time. So we give you those common groundings in first year and then at the end, well, around about April in first year, we gather everybody in and say, are you on the right degree programme for you? You came in to do biology, are you quite happy to stay on a biology degree? Or actually, would you really quite want to go into molecular biology? Because you found that's the units in second year that's going to interest you the most. Or did you come in on neuroscience and actually you really want to do pharmacology? So a lot of people do uh, change at the end of their first year, about 25% in fact. So quite a lot of people do, do um, move around. And then the units become more uh, specialised then in second year, and then in final year, even more specialised for your degree programme. And for some degree programmes, the specialism kicks in a bit earlier. You know, if you're doing biochemistry, you'll be doing biochemistry from year one. If you're doing something like immunology, the immunology-specific units may not kick in until year two and year three, you know, because you need the fundamentals of the other subjects to be able to tackle them. 
Now, as we say you can swap between different uh, degrees, uh, of course, there is always some caveats, terms and conditions uh, apply. Uh, and there are some things that you do have to, say, have a good grounding in chemistry for. So, for instance, if you want to carry on in a biochemistry, medical biochemistry or molecular biology degree, you have to have done some um, core chemistry units in first year. So they will be compulsory if you're on the degree of biochemistry. They will be optional for everybody else. So if you're in biomedical sciences, you could opt to do the hardcore chemistry units as well. So then you could change to biochemistry in your second year if you wanted to. So you will be advised about that when you arrive, which, which ones are prerequisites for changing degree programme or which ones you need to have done in your first year to carry on in the second year. It's, it's usually quite a, um, a straight process. Now, th these are the ways that you can actually change uh, your degrees. Most people will probably have applied for uh, or are thinking about applying for a three-year degree, the straight BSc degree. We have a lot of four-year options as well. Uh, the entry qualifications are the same, whether it's for a three-year degree or a four-year degree. But staying on the four-year degree means that you will have to get certain marks in first year and second year. So we, you may start on a four-year degree, but actually after your first year marks, you may not be able to continue on it, if you like. So when you put a four-year degree down as your choice, you're basically just indicating to us that's what you would like to do. Now, the way you can actually uh, change it, the first one, is to do it with a modern language. So we do uh, French, Spanish, German, Italian... Uh, or you can do it with Mandarin or Japanese. If you're doing it with a European language, you will need to have an A-level in that language. If you want to take Japanese or Mandarin, uh, you need to have shown knowledge capability with a formal qualification. We recognise not everybody can have done A-levels in those subjects. So you do, do just need to show as you have got some language capability. And this means in this degree, you do the first two years uh, the same as everybody else. Your optional units would then be in that language. So you will take 20 credits worth of Spanish or German in your first year. Uh, if at the end of the first year you find you're not really that bothered about the German, then you would just drop back to the ordinary third year. And, you, you, you know, the op your options were in German, but that, that, that's, that's fine. You, so you do the first two years, you do language units interspersed with your bioscience units. Then in the third year, you would go on a placement in a country that speaks the language that you're studying. So you'd be working in a lab. Uh, we have um, partnerships with different universities, uh, and you would go over there and spend a year working in a lab, doing some science and learning the language as well. And as all the people who go to Italy and uh, Switzerland, lots of skiing as well, which, which we, we can't really offer that in Manchester. So that, that is uh, a, a nice perk of doing those kind of placements. And then you come back for your fourth year and you, you slot into the fourth year, um, into the third year with everybody else, do your final year units and then graduate with a modern language. So that's something to be think, thinking about if you want to carry on your languages. We also offer with entrepreneurship. And in entrepreneurship, your optional units will be uh, business um, units that are run by the business school. So this is like um, enterprise, uh, business innovation, uh, entrepreneurship, or I can't remember what they are. And so you do that mingled with the biosciences in first and second year. And then in third year, you go on a placement in a company that could be uh, in, a, in another country, it could be in Manchester, it could be in the UK somewhere, uh, and you have that year's experience working either in the biosciences or it could be in a management company, you know, it's, it's your choice, then you come back and finish your degree. Now, the, these two options, because you have to do certain units in first and second year, you can't switch on and on, you can't switch on to the entrepreneurship degree or the language degree. You have to come wanting to do those kind of degrees. We can switch you off them, but you can't, you can't switch to them. Okay? The other two options we have are a little bit more uh, flexible. If you want to do a bioscience degree with an industrial or professional experience, you do the biosciences full on for two years. And then in the third year, you go on the placements. Uh, we provide the placements. We have loads of... Um, collaborations with different companies, you know, over 100 companies, they come to us and say, oh, we'd like to take three placement students, please. We advertise them, you apply for them, you may get interviewed, um, and then if they give you the placement, then that's yours for the year. I'll show you a map in a moment as to where some of our placement students have gone. And it's a really good way to get experience. Um, you know, because 
often people will have come into the bioscience you know, from school, from college, have no other work experience that's, that's relevant to a bioscience um, career. So having that year out in a company, working for a year, and then coming back and joining our final year, and then graduating, you have that experience already. So it's a really, really good thing to do, the industrial uh, and placement year. So this is uh, the map of placements that we've had in the past. Lots of them in the UK, lots of them in Manchester. Uh, you know, so you don't have to go far afield if you don't want to. Lots of them in Europe. These are often for our language students at the university research places. Uh, some of these placements are paid employment. Uh, for instance, the one that's in Florida, in Jacksonville, that's at the Mayo Clinic. So a very prestigious place to work. They pay $26,000 a year. So you do your placement and you get paid for it as well. Uh, and of course, some of these, you know, the ones that get paid money, um, you know, are very popular. So you're in competition with other people uh, going for these placements. We have quite a few in, in Germany, in research uh, biotech companies there. And we, we, we show you these placements. You, you go for them during your second year. Um, most people who want to go on a placement do, do get one, you know, if they persevere. About 150 people have gone on placement this year. Uh, and so they're out there in, in a company. Some of the placements don't pay. It's for the experience only. Or it's just board and lodgings or something like that. So, you know, you would still get access to student loans, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, so then our last option is the um, integrated masters. So the integrated masters is where you do your first two years the same as everybody else, lots of bioscience or wacky optional units if you want to. Uh, then in the third year, you start to think about uh, uh, research in a laboratory and you do some units that are just for people on the masters, some bioinformatics, etc. And then in, and you make contact with a, an academic member of staff who you will then work with in their lab in, in fourth year. So the whole of the last year um, it's probably the first time in your life you won't have exams at Christmas of that year, sorry, in the January period, um, which is a great relief to people doing masters. And they're just, they're in the labs from, you know, October until um, April. So they have a really good time in the lab. It's very, very good um, if you're thinking of going to do a PhD afterwards, because we know that the research is taking place in our research labs here. We know it's a lot of science, uh, and we, so we know that it's going to be at master's level. So you will graduate then with an MSI in whichever discipline uh, your degree is. So this sort of like try before you buy doing a PhD is, is actually really good if you want to do the Masters. Now, as I said before, to stay on the industrial placement year or to stay on the integrated Masters, you do have to get a certain mark in first year and second year. So we are expecting you know, people to find the academic work quite straightforward. Uh, and so there are entry qualifications when you're here to do those kinds of degrees. Now, another way we can think about um, changing your degree, which you may want to compare with other universities, is thinking about field courses. So going out in the fields, working with people um, you know, as, as a team, and looking at the wildlife that's out there is, is something that really attracts people to biology, is why, why they want to do it. Now, we have several field courses on offer, <laughs> which of course are subject to change depending on uh, staff availability, but they're, they're quite, quite stable at the moment. Doing a field course is compulsory if you're doing the degree of zoology. You only have to do one field course, you don't have to do loads of them, but it is compulsory. Um, and they're optional if you're doing biology or if you're doing life sciences. So of course, um, this may be a reason why you would opt for biology as opposed to biomedical sciences, because field courses are not available if you're doing all the other degree programs. So that might be a reason why you put zoology or biology instead of some of the others. And the field courses we have, at the moment we have one in uh, Costa Rica, uh, in South Africa, we've developed a new one in, in uh, Malaysia, we go to the Italian Alps, there's one in Mallorca, there's one in Scotland, uh, and then there's one looking at um, urban biodiversity in Manchester streams and canals as well, which, which is very popular. Uh, so, of course, there is, a, there is a cost implication of doing field trips. They're all subsidised. Um, however, some of them are free. The Manchester one is free, and one going to the local area is free as well. So, you know, because it's compulsory for a degree, there is a, a no-cost option as well if, if you want to do. But actually, looking in the Manchester Ship Canal... 
will open your eyes. So it's actually a really, really good, good one to do. Uh, yeah, so, so those are the field courses, and they may determine which, which degree you go for. Have a chat with the field course um, stand in the Michael Smith building, and the people there will be able to tell you uh, how much they've enjoyed the field courses. Right, so in, in the last sort of 10 minutes, I'm going to go through the application process uh, and how you get uh, to be here. Uh, you're, there's one deadline, the 15th of October. Oh, that's today, isn't it? So that's if people wanted to apply for medicine uh, or if they want to apply for uh, Oxford or Cambridge or veterinary dentistry. They, they have different application processes, so they have an early deadline. For most of you, your deadline is the 25th of January, so you've still got plenty of time to make your mind up, no matter what your school says. We treat all of them uh, with due... <coughs> due process? I can't remember, there's some terminology. Anyway, whether you apply early or whether you apply right on the deadline, we will look at your application without prejudice and, you know, you, you will be assessed. You know, we don't sort of fill up and go, we'll fill all our places now. Tough. You know, you can apply right on the deadline, um, and, which is what a lot of people do, uh, understandably. Now, by January, we will have had about 7,000 applications, and that is for round about 655 places. So we need a way of narrowing it down uh, as to who we're going to give offers to. So the admissions team look at the UCAS application that you have sweated over, uh, and they'll just have a quick check to make sure that your GCOCs look like you're in line for your predicted A-level grades. Your predicted A-level grades is, is the thing we're most interested in, and what subjects you are doing as well. I'll, I'll show you what the offer is in a moment. And we look at your personal statement and your reference too. Now, we're not looking for anything in particular in the personal statement. We're looking for effort. OK, I, I want to do biochemistry because I like it. My mum told me it was a good thing to do. You know, so just, just look like you've made a bit of an effort. Uh, so we want to see, do you, do you think you understand what the degree is? And this is a very, uh, you know, really important if you're applying for something like, say, pharmacology. Because if you write it as though you're applying for pharmacy, which is a vocational degree and is a very different discipline, you know, we will contact you and say, you sound like you actually want to apply for pharmacy and not pharmacology. Uh, and similarly, if, you're, if your statement is tailored towards medicine or tailored towards dentistry, we will contact you and say, can you provide us with an alternative personal statement? Okay, so we, we, will, we will ask for that. Um, it's great if you've done extra reading or things you find enjoyable, you know, if you were in the biology olympiad or the maths olympiad or you represented your school at a particular thing, you've entered a competition, you know, just, just to show that you've got some interest in the subject. If you've got any work experience, whether that's working in a, in a lab or something biosciencey, or whether it's working in Costa Coffee or the Amazon warehouse or whatever job you're doing, tell us that you've got a part-time job. That shows you can balance your academic work and having a job, which is, is no mean feat. If you haven't got a job and you've not been able to work as well, don't worry. We're not going to go, mm. not everybody has the opportunity to work. We recognise that. We're not looking for anything in particular. We're just looking like you've made an effort. We love EPQs. Tell us about your EPQ that you've done. It, doesn't, it won't form part of the formal process of our offer, but it's a really good thing to have done, showing you've had that oomph to do it yourself, uh, and it shows that you're, you know, you're ready for higher education level work if you can do something independent. You never know, it may come in on results day if we have to make some decisions about people who haven't quite made that offer. So it's always going to look good. It's not going to look bad if you've done an EPQ. So we, we've streamlined our offers this year. Uh, we're actually only giving two offers out. We're either going to give a straight 3A offer or the offer will be two A's and a B. Now, all of these are subject to contextual offers as outlined on our website. So if that applies to you, ha have a look and see what kind of dropped grade offer you could possibly get. We will give an offer of, we want you to do two hardcore sciences. Two core sciences, not hardcore, two core sciences. Uh, so you either do biology, chemistry, physics, or maths. So any two of those. It'd be lovely if you did biology and chemistry. I didn't do biology A-level. Um, I, I went down the physics, maths, further maths routes. What was I thinking? Uh, and chemistry. And then I, I came to love biology and thought, yeah, biology, it's applied chemistry, isn't it? It's much more interesting, believe me. Uh, so biology, chemistry, physics, and maths. So we, if you're doing two of those, we expect you to get two A's in those two 
to hard sciences. And then whatever th your third subject is, if you're predicted an A, we'll give you an offer of three A's. If you're predicted a B, we'll give you an offer of two A's and a B. And that's because we want you to reach your potential. So if, you're, if your school thinks you can get A's, we're not, we're not offering A stars this year. If your school thinks you can get an A, we want you to work for that A. Work to the best of your ability, and you'll be so proud of it if you do get that A. Now, we get your results a few days before you get them. So you get them on a Thursday. Um, we get them on the Sunday. Actually, this year, we got them on the Saturday afternoon. Um, and so we get the results early, so we can see who has made that offer. And if you've made your offer, then you're in. Whatever the offer is, you are in. If you haven't made the offer and you've dropped a grade, or even a couple of grades, we may be able to take you. Now, in the last couple of years, we haven't been able to do that. I'm going to be straight with you. We haven't been able to take anybody who dropped their grades from the offer. In previous years, so pre-2019, we've always been able to take people who've dropped a grade. So we don't, we don't know where it's going to lie this year. So we're probably not going to go be below two A's and a B or contextual offers, if that applies. Uh, so if you're taking just one core science, but you're taking a, science, a soft science like psychology, geography, PE, actually, or environmental science, it doesn't say that here, um, environmental science, we will ask you just to get three A's, whatever your predicted grades are. So it's going to be a straight three A offer if you've only done one science. Foundation year, if you haven't done enough sciences, um, then you can apply to the foundation year, and this would take place in an FE college uh, just down the road in, in Russia, where you would do biology, chemistry, and maths in a quite an intensive year to get you up to the standard for our first year. And we do find on results day, if people have dropped grades, no matter what A-levels they did, we will offer people a foundation year place on results day as well, if people haven't quite got the grades they were expected to get um, from their, their school or colleges predicted offers. Okay. So when you apply to us, as I say, you just need to put us on once, uh, and then when you, we'll, we'll invite you up for um, an offer holders day. We'll show you around the campus. We'll give you a tour around, uh, and you can see the teaching labs and see all the inside of the um, buildings that the students can use. Uh, you, um, you can come with the parents or a, um, you know, a friend. We'll peel you off the people you've come with, and we'll do a parents tour as well for them, if, if you want to. We're not going to make the parents go on a tour, but they usually quite like it. Um, and then the applicants can go off on a tour. The applicants will also go in the lab and do some demonstrations in our teaching lab. So we'll show you some of our equipment and some of the things that you might do whilst you're here. And whilst you're on that in, um, offer holders day, that's where you might have a conversation and say, well, you've given me an offer for biochemistry. Actually, I think I prefer to do medical biochemistry. And we could amend the, the what we've offered you for them. So if, if you're having some thoughts about which one to go for, we, we can amend it right up until, um, you know, before we get the results in, in August. In fact, at any, any point in the process, you can let us know. The other thing we, we, is nice to know as well is if, uh, you know, anything happens during the year, and even though we've given you an offer for some predicted grades, if those predicted grades are not likely, then you can always let us know and we can have that on our file when it comes to results day. So maybe we could be a little bit more lenient in, in what, what places we're taking on. We do the offer holders days. They're going to be probably after, there might be one before Christmas, um, but they'll definitely be sort of February and March next year. Um, but yes, and so round about well, 1,200, 1,500 people will probably put us as first choice, and then on results day we'll take round about 700, and then people in the foundation year. Uh, so just to finish off then, a typical week when you're here, uh, people often want to know about um, what contact time. Uh, of course, in the last couple of years, it's been really disrupted with COVID and lots of things have been online or pre-recorded. For our first year, we've gone pretty much back to in-person lectures. Uh, we have timetable slots for your lectures, which could be for any time from 9 a.m. Um, to 5 p.m. Uh, le le afternoon lectures. You have around about 10 hours of lecture time. Some of those will be face-to-face. -face. There may be some where we're asking you to read something or do something and then come to the lecture theatre and, and do some activities. Around about 10 hours of face-to-face -face time, I'd, I'd say, in first year. 
uh, practicals. We have a, a blend of being in the laboratory, doing things with you know, pipettes and electrophoresis and, and looking at bacteria on plates, etc. Um, so we'll do some lab work in first year and we'll also have some online practicals as well. Research is all about looking at data. What does it mean? What's the experiment? What's the next experiment we could do? You know, so you do have to do some analysis, sort of dry practical work, as well as being in the lab and, and learning to how to use the equipment. So it could be around about five hours of practical work, by which we mean sometime possibly in the lab, sometime possibly online, and sometimes doing data handling as well. So a blended approach there. You will be put in a tutor group when you arrive. Your tutor will be around about 10 people in a tutor group. Um, and your tutor will be from the degree discipline that you've been accepted into. So again, this might make a difference as to which degree you go for. If you put biomedical sciences, which is a very broad sounding degree, um, all the people in your tutor group may have very different interests. So some people may be very interested in you know, the human body and disease and you know, cardiovascular stuff. Some people may be very interested in molecular biology. Some people may, may be very interested in genetics. And your tutor could be a microbiologist. So when they ask you to write an essay, they may give you microbiology essay titles. Whereas if you come and do, say, immunology, all the people in your group will be interested in immunology, and your tutor will be an immunologist. So there'll be, you know, it's, it's, it's a chance to get a real flavour of which bit of the biosciences you're really into. Uh, you'll have tutorials n not quite every week, but a lot of weeks in the, in the, um, through the semester. And here we're looking at things like writing essays, doing presentations, reading papers, exploring why you like this research discipline that you've uh, opted for. Uh, and then in the second year, you'll be in a different tutor group with a different tutor, and in final year as well. But the tutor who you started off with in first year, they will be your academic advisor. So they will be the ones that write you references, that will call you and have a one-to-one -one chat with you a couple of times in the semester to see how you're doing. Um, look at your exam results, you know, if you want to discuss with you if you want to change your degree programmes or you're not sure about MSI or industrial placement year, etc. So everybody who comes in here has a, an academic member of staff that they can go to who has, you know, has their back, if you like. So that, that everybody has somebody that they can have these kind of chats with, which I think is quite important when it's a very big year group. Big year group, some of the degree programmes, biomedical sciences take 200 people. You know, immunology may take five. You know, so it's, it's very varied. Um, but you're in a tutor group with 10 people who'd be interested in the same subject, and you have a tutor who's interested in, in you as well. And I know that this really is the last thing I'm going to say, is careers. What are you going to do with a bioscience degree? Well, the question is, what can't you do with a bioscience degree? Um, bioscience is, is th this is where our, our graduates have gone. I'm a scientist, we've got to have a pie chart. You can't have a talk without some kind of pie chart. And, and here it is. Uh, so you can see in purple on the left-hand side, uh, you know, 35% of people will go into postgraduate study, so uh, a master's degree or a PhD. Generally speaking, if you're going to a PhD, you will have to have done a master's first or our four-year degrees with the industrial placement year or the integrated master's. So people go on to further study, and this means that they they get a chance to specialise in a, an area of bioscience. So really often it doesn't matter which undergraduate degree you've got because your master's or your PhD will really get your specialism down. About 14% will go off and work in a lab, so a pharmaceutical lab, a hospital lab, or, or, or do something you know, that is using their degree in their degree discipline and using their science. So nearly half, half of the year group go off and carry on with their science in some way. 5% um, will go off and do teaching, so whether that's Teach First or a PGCE, where primary, uh, you know, middle school, high school, further education, uh, go off and do teaching. Um, about 6% will go off and do medicine afterwards, whether as a graduate medicine course, uh, which is four years, or a five-year medical degree. Of course, if you're thinking of going down that route, there is a funding implication, so you might want to look at the student loan company about how much that might cost people if they do it, but a lot, a lot of people do. Um, or they might want to go and do something like the physician's associate's uh, degree uh, afterwards, um, and which will enable you to do hospital work as well. 
But you can see a massive big chunk, 36%. So a lot of people go off to a degree, uh, sorry, go off to a career that isn't actually using their bioscience as such. So it didn't really matter which year one module you did or year two unit you chose that you're agonising over because what they're interested in is you having skills. So graduate skills, being able to write, being able to talk, being able to argue a point, uh, being able to give presentations, time managing, taking, con taking responsibility for what you are doing. We need more of that in this world. Uh, that's what I say. So those graduate skills, so that you can go off into graduate careers, whether it's a fast-track civil service job or it's working for a management consultant or one of these big graduate FTSE 500 companies. Uh, so all of these, they are looking for graduates that they can train because you've already got the raw material of being able to do a lot of this stuff already. They don't care if you're a biochemist. They don't care if you did zoology. You know, they're, what they're looking for is a graduate. And the graduates that these companies are generally looking for are bioscientists or historians. These are the two most popular degrees that go into these kind of uh, areas because we are giving you the transferable skills uh, that are useful for you. So if we look uh, to help you get a job, now personally I don't think you should be worrying about this too much. Your parents might be worrying about it, but you really shouldn't. Because uh, what we think is if you go into a degree that you find interesting, and you're doing it in a city that you think, oh, I like living here, this seems like a, a nice place to be, then you will work hard in your degree. It isn't extra reading if you're enjoying it, you're just doing it because, hey, this is cool. Uh, and then you'll get a good degree. And if you get a good degree, then all these jobs open up for you and all these choices then. Uh, and if you need help on the way, our career service is a really good career service. It's won lots of top awards. Um, and in fact, it's been voted the best UK university career service in the last few years. It steadily wins this award. We're a big university. Employers come to us and say, can we talk to your graduates? So they hold, um, you know, graduate kind of fairs with the companies coming. We have a lot of graduates. So we have a lot of alumni who come back and say, hey, I did zoology. Look what I'm doing now. Uh, and that's always very useful to see as well. And they will help you whilst you are here. They will look, give you CV surgeries to help you write a CV for a science job or a marketing job. They'll do practice interviews with you as well. So if you something that's worried you in the past, you can get help doing it. So our career service, it's on the website, you can have a look at it, it's really, really useful too. And they help you even after you've you know, graduated as well. You have access to the university careers uh, service. And incidentally, if you need a part-time job whilst you're here, they can advertise those kind of jobs too. Okay, so the next steps... Um, I'm finishing the talk now, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, so please go over to Michael Smith, talk to the students there. If you've got particular questions about your um, predicted grades, etc., or your admissions qualifications, the admissions team are over there to help you out too. Of course, I've just talked about A-levels. All of these are equivalents in if you're doing an international baccalaureate or you're doing a higher access to higher education diploma. You can see the, um, the equivalences on our website if you use the drop-down menus. Um, there are on-campus tours on, on the buses if you want to go around. Um, please look at our bioscience course web pages, really useful. And of course, do look at our research because it'll, it'll blow your mind and think, wow, why didn't I do that earlier? So as applicants now, this is your chance to be part of biology. Okay, so I'm going to finish now. Thank you very much. As I said before, you can leave the room on both sides and at the back as well.